Welcome to today's show. I have a special guest. Every, every week I have a special guest. <laughs> but today's guest is extremely special in the moment, mainly because... He's an opera singer. <laughs> <laughs> See, I thought you were going to go a different place with that. <laughs> and, and, and also, he's a retired police sergeant from the IMPD. Welcome, Chris Wilburn. Hey, what's up, brother? I appreciate you inviting me. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. Thanks for, your, thanks for all your um, hard work and uh, pol policing and uh, community service, man. That's, Those are some great years. We, we appreciate it. Well, and I appreciate you saying that because oftentimes we don't get that, uh, that pat on the back. Right, right. Um, and not, not that you don't deserve it, right? but I do feel that— um, Police officers choose to do what they do. That's exactly right. And they shouldn't they shouldn't expect much. Yeah, and in, in, in terms of uh uh Gratitude. Accolade, Yeah, that's right, right. Yeah. Nor should they seek it. Right, <laughs> right, right. But can you give us a little background? Can you tell me where you're from? Yeah, that's right. Let's let's hear yeah. what made you choose a, a career in service. That's right. So originally I'm from the uh, south side of Chicago. So I'm uh, a stone's throw, I guess, if you look at it from yeah, uh, not far, two out, two yeah, and a half, yeah. not bad at all. Yeah. And um, and I had initially some reservations about service, but um, from Chicago, we were uh, moved to Georgia. So believe it or not, I graduated from uh, Stone Mountain High School in, okay. in Georgia. Okay. And from there, I went to the University of South Carolina. I had a background in music, so I was actually I'm actually trained as an opera singer, believe it or not. Right. And I uh, have that background there in singing, a tenor. I uh, went on to Boston University to complete uh, my master's. So at that time, I, I I was all holistically involved in the arts. Right. And, and So at what age is this? Yeah, so th from an early age, I started really singing in choir at Pilgrim Baptist Church. And if, if people know their history, Pilgrim was like the central place where gospel music was was birthed by uh, Thomas A. Dorsey. Whoa. So it's pretty profound in, in terms of history of gospel music. But yep. so I was singing in the choir at a very young age. And then it wasn't until about 12 or 13 that we actually moved to the South. Okay. And from that point, kind of got my uh, education, played a little football for a bit. Okay. And then You're a when, big guy. Yeah, I can see you being man, athletic. Hey, right. It's hidden <laughs> with all these kegs. <laughs> Your uh, family, are they all musically inclined? No, it's funny. You're, the big source of entertainment for us back then was the upright piano. <laughs> okay. We all kind of tickled those keys for a little yep. bit and uh, played uh, guitar. I have a guitar at home and um, a little bass at home. And it just kind of fiddling around with right. it. So that was a big main source of, of, of entertainment. But we all sang. And we all kind of grew up with that appreciation for music and appreciation for what um, sort of uh, the, the the feelings, the, the emote, uh, uh, to speak in the vernacular here. But it was it was it was a good childhood. We didn't have a lot of things. Right. But it, it was it was the only thing that I knew. OK, you know, but it wasn't until I what really the question you asked was what really brought me into policing, right? Uh, so I got married uh, from uh, my experience of after completing my degree at uh, Boston University and literally, bro, within the first six or seven months, boom, we were pregnant. Wow. <laughs> Not me, my yeah. wife. <laughs> uh, right. But yeah, so it was crazy, right. man. Okay. And, and and I think for me, what I, I didn't want to do, because I, I was I was raised by a single uh, mother. Okay. I didn't want to be that type of guy or that type of father for my kids. So I was like, you know what, Chris, put your stuff on hold for a bit. Yep. You know, what and else? You mean putting the music on yes, hold? Yes, that's right. Put okay. the music on hold. Yes, sir. Um, but I didn't realize that was my muse. That was my outlet because okay. of the trauma that I had experienced at a young age in Chicago. Okay. And that's a whole different, uh, <laughs> that's a whole different tangent, bro. Yeah. Uh, it, was it was tough. It was challenging. But I think for me, not having that male role model with exception of like your, you know, your coaches or, 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 the, right. or your grandparents. Yep. Most of us, right? Yep. So I'll say, that, uh, you know, I want to stop. I want to pause, put the brakes on this and focus on really, really rearing uh, some kids. At the time, I didn't know if it was going to be a boy or a girl and just kind of moved on that way, man. Yep. And then I said, well, what what would be a, a, a place where you can really, really just throw your put your flag down? And I'd always considered some sort of. Uh, service in the military or, yep. or, or or some kind of nonprofit. Okay. And there was just like 
commercial after commercial on policing and firefighting. So I tried to go. I, I tried to get hired at FD at IFD, man. Really? But everybody in out, Mo- out of Boston, though. Like, yeah. So, so why did you pick right. Indianapolis? So we came from Boston, and I wanted to work on uh, a doctorate, man. So I was down at IU Bloomington, and I was singing in. Uh, uh, we did a world premiere of Our Town. I was okay. one of the leads there. The okay. New York Times reviewed it. Uh, so that was really, really a, a, a pivotal point for me. And I thought from there, after completing that doctorate, two and a half, three years, then yep. we were going to go to California because she wanted to go to universe, uh, uh, University of Southern Cal. to As complete. she should. Yeah, Fight right? Fight on, baby. Fight <laughs> on. <laughs> I'm telling you, boy, USC is no joke. And no I've been joke. to California. I love it there, man. Me the weather too. is wonderful. Yes, it is. Uh, but that's not a knock on Indy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But so from that point, it was just, it was like a whirlwind within that time frame. Yep. I was like, whoa, I was already in school yeah. uh, and uh, assistant assistant instructor at IU in, in Bloomington. Okay. Yeah. And then we were like, hey, newly married. You know how that goes, man. Yes, Eating sir. ramen noodles, beans and rice and yeah, not having slumming. the money. Yeah, yeah, brother. Just trying to find a way. Trying to find a way. And I think I'd always really wanted to serve. And then I saw these commercials and I said, I'll give it a try. So I put a lot of a lot of time and emphasis in, in, in really setting myself up for success and try to show who I really was. Right. And I applied for a number of police departments uh, and I got offers from a lot of them. And I told my wife, I said, hey, look, whichever, you know, strike while the iron's hot, whichever uh, uh, department says yes, yeah. I'm going to go with them first. Oh, okay. And so that's what I did. Yep. You know, I didn't want to um, play games or try to, you know, all the things that people do that they can do. Uh, like when when choosing a department, yeah. Because okay, so yeah. so that means so you're talking about kind of when people try to find easier neighborhoods. That's exactly or, right, or, right? Or areas that's to ex- police. That's exactly right, and yeah. I'm glad you, that you hit on that. And I'm not I'm not speaking disparagingly about those communities, but right. policing in Indianapolis, policing in an urban environment, a bigger city, is different. And a lot of times, uh, uh, a lot of people who call the police uh, when the police show up. Uh, they aren't. They don't look like them, and right. that is a hard thing. It's a barrier at first. So yeah. I was like, you know what? I can serve in the capacity. Uh, at times, the police department was they were utilizing my voice to sing national anthem, yeah. and, I, and I didn't mind it because <laughs> I said, look, I said, hey, is it okay if I sing in uniform? And the reason I did that was because I wanted people when they saw a black man in uniform that. The brother, oh, he he sings classical music, opera. Right, what I right. mean, that's that's you were, something. You, you yeah, were, you were you were breaking a lot of stereotypes. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, would, I mean, police yes. singing opera. Yes, not absolutely. just singing opera. That's exactly right. Yeah. And at the time, uh, there was a very small percentage of brothers um, employed, but who had their master's degree, and I was one of them. And and it it, it was it was good, but there was a lot of uh, jealousy and there was a lot of uh, animosity uh, geared towards me by my white colleagues uh, yeah. who didn't even have a, a, a college degree at all right. in positions of power. Mm-hmm. And then that can talk toggle to a whole host of things of what's going on now with the Black Lives Matter movement. But so it was very very exciting for me. So yeah. I kind of moved on from there, man. And just kind of now I'm in law school. We'll talk about that yeah, later right, on. It's crazy. Right. right. So Time goes by fast. I, I really want to get into the inner workings right. of um, policing. Good. Good. In Indianapolis. Right. And in general. Right. 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 There are. Um, I would say there are um, levels and there are a lot of um, different layers mm-hmm. to, to being a police officer, I would say. Right. Correct. Um, it's kind of a fraternity. That's right. You know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Right. And there, there's a turn like there's a there's a thing that I always tell cops. They're like everybody always says it's only a few bad cops. Right. Right. Only a few. And I and I agree that there are a few people who are. um have malintent, mm-hmm. you know. I, I think that I think that policing is a very honorable job, 100%. even though it's a choice. Right. But it's a very honorable job, and there when there are when when we use that term, there's a there's few bad cops. Mm-hmm. We have to understand that to recognize that there are a few bad cops. That means that there's good cops that know there's bad cops. Yes, that's right. That's good. This is good. You know. Yeah, that's and good. I want to know, like, mm-hmm. you know, how does it feel when you are a good cop mm-hmm. and you recognize a bad cop because because from history it's been shown that 
good cops are the ones that seem to disappear. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, that's a good. Let, let's look at let's 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 backtrack a little bit and let's yeah. talk about really really how policing kind of evolved where it came from. Right. Let's originally, the history of policing. Yeah, the, originally, um, police really started with slave patrol, and that was like whoa when people hear that. But that's yeah. the honest. That's right. the history of it. Yeah. So there was always this aggressor and this victim and right. that that type of uh, of mentality. The most vivid picture that people uh, paint of policing when they look at the 60s and how police treated right. uh, uh, the civil, treated rights, civil rights movement. Yeah. But I think like if you look at the Slave Patrol, you look at the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, like uh, these kinds of uh, tactics and, police, and policing and brutality uh, was was made evident and, and really didn't come into a uh, clearer focus and, uh, and and this is one of the, I, I think, the linchpin itch, issues that really, really showed how how uh, law enforcement is really viewed within the context of the black community was the Tulsa uh, massacre. Yeah, right, right. You know, when yeah, yeah, man, yeah, when man, when you when you're Street. that's exactly yeah. right. When you're when you're massacring or you're deputizing citizens and giving them the legal authority uh, and the impunity to go out and and literally wreak havoc and kill people. Right. Uh, that's a problem. Right. Uh, the Constitution was established with no accountability. With no accountability. Right. So when you look at all of those things in the trajectory of where that goes, there's a huge disdain for police in general within the black community. Right. You know, so that that's that's where it goes. But the 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 the, the, the source of your question is very good because there are so many subcultures in policing, uh, many of which never really manifest themselves until there's a problem. OK, you know, until yeah. there's a shooting, until there is an officer involved in uh, uh, activity that he or she shouldn't. Right. So there are a lot of good officers in there, but their voices are unfortunately drowned out by the negative environment that they're put in, uh, the lack of accountability from the leadership. Most yeah. most often it's the leadership okay. who enjoy Monday through Friday, <laughs> uh, eight to five jobs yep. uh, who make uh, six figures plus. Just want to get home. Yep. Uh, shaking hands, slapping backs and kissing babies. And the officers and the sergeants and lieutenants are out there interacting. Notice I didn't say dealing with people, but right. interacting with people at right. their lowest sometimes. Yeah. And that is trauma. And that's traumatic for an individual to experience. So what I did was I tried to ask questions rather than be accusatory. I asked questions. Yep. And in those meetings, I would ask questions, but then I would get shut down. I would get like this sign or like cut or, you know, like be literally. quiet. Yeah, literally like, hey, you, you're just the patrolman. Whoa, whoa, whoa. First and foremost, I don't need this uniform to be a man. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I'm a grown man. Exactly. And, 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 and I'm not going to speak disparagingly about you. Give me the basic respect of, of, of allowing me to have an opinion. Correct. And I think what, what really cripples a lot of police departments is the pseudo military style. Yeah. It really yeah. cripples them. And here's what, here's what we forget. When we talked about history, we talk about that. A lot of police departments were birthed, uh, uh, by military personnel and they brought over a lot of what we call general orders, yeah. rules, policies, and procedures that are, I, I, I'm not going to say a carbon copy, but they duplicate what you have now in common military uh, like they, uh, service. They treat their environment That's like exactly a war right. zone. That 100% right. right. Yeah. And when you have that type of mentality, uh, it's tough to shake. It is incredibly tough to shake. Yeah. I know people are going to be like, but you've never been. There may be some listeners who are police. And they're, well, you've never been in a critical incident before. You never. Yeah, I have. And I've had to discharge my firearm. We'll talk about that, too. Yeah. And I've been in fights. And it, yeah. it, 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 it's, it takes a toll on you. Right. You know, it takes a toll on you. But the the challenge for a lot of police departments, and they don't want to come to grips with this, is there there are very few conversations uh, involved in toward what I like to call mission driven policing. Okay. And what that means is that uh, you know you can't leave an individual on on a condition red. Red is the most it's the danger critical. point. It's critical. Yeah. You can't leave officers on critical condition all the time. Right. And these men and women are seeing. Uh, people shot, women stabbed, babies dying, and they never get to be removed from that situation. Oh. And so what ends up happening, when I saw that eight minutes and 48 seconds, to me, with the nonchalant, uh, with the lack of emotion in his eyes, that I saw somebody who was wrong, 
Mm-hmm. I saw somebody who had no regard for human life. I saw somebody who was probably tired. I saw somebody who didn't listen. <laughs> yeah. All of these yeah. things kind of compounded and created the perfect storm. And I think that there was nothing perfect about that outcome. But I, I, I began to see from a lens that I lived myself, yeah. lived experience. Right. And so I think for a lot of people, they don't understand those subcultures. You have military thinking, I said, educated and non-educated. Yeah. Uh, families who've been in policing for years right. who are expected to be commanders or now even small cliques of people who move around yeah. from different leadership positions or even testing to be promoted. There is no, there is no um, uh, streamlined process. And what I mean by that is police uh, profess to be subject matter experts in accounting or subject matter experts in computing yeah. or subject matter experts in um, uh, social work activity. These are all of the things that police departments are doing today. Okay. And that's a problem. Yeah. You know, so I hope I answered when, your question. When they need to just be policing. That's exactly right. Yeah. And people say the, uh, uh, you hear the old adage, you know, just kick back on the porch, prop your boots up, put a, put a, <laughs> some star in your mouth and kick <laughs> right. back. Right. Like the good old right. days. Right. But, but, but now uh, you need police to interact. You need to humanize uh, law enforcement and you need to have diversity in police agencies, you're yeah. going to hear people say defund the police. I was actually one of the individuals who say, yeah, you fund. And that is a reallocation of resources right. to me. Well, what, you just stopped, yeah. you just talked about all the yeah. roles that police exactly play right. yeah. and what people don't seem to understand. No, they don't. They can't get they, get, they can't get past the, the verbiage. Yes. Defund. Can, there you go. They're scared of the word. <laughs> yes. Just like they're scared of the word Black Lives Matter. That's exactly they're right. They're scared. Well, you saw what happened. I mean, it, it, initially you saw a uh, federal uh, senators, uh, all lives matter. When you hear Black Lives Matter, it wasn't that nobody else's lives matter. It was Black Lives Matter right. too. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, and well, we I just want to show y'all yeah, yeah. that we do care about our own lives. Yes, that's exactly that are right. being taken away without accountability. That's exactly that's right. what we want. Black Lives Matter is a is a show of accountability. We want people to pay for killing people that don't need to die. That's what yes. I think Black Lives Matter means. And I think that, that that's exactly what it means in my in my uh, view as well. If we look at back at history from all of the massacres that have occurred, I think and this I, I can't prove this, but I think that people had just had enough. Right. I mean, there were there were there are countless instances where you see people of color uh, completely demonized and. Uh, and, and thrown in jail uh, and killed right. and uh, set up and and, and 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 we know we're not we're not novices in saying that black people don't do anything no uh, that they, they're they're not culpable no Absolutely. we're not saying not. that yeah. but the but the but but the large majority of people now that are incarcerated have have presented small I mean fractions of uh, of uh, um, egregious behavior that deserve being incarcerated for the, for the amount of for time the amount of time that they receive. I mean, it's, right. un, it's, it, right. it, it's unconscionable. I mean, that, there's, there's, there's so many different things we can talk about mm-hmm. with, with plea deals mm-hmm. and cash bail and things that, that affect um, mm-hmm. communities of color way more than other, other people. But it starts with policing. It starts with the policing, yeah. but, uh, and, and, and privatizing of jails, yes. things like that, where they have to fill these places up. And it doesn't matter who you put in there, as long as you're putting people in jail. And and and, and I think you're hitting a hammer. You're hitting the hammer right on the nail. I know you are because that's reminiscent of fugitive slate uh, leasing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you know where you have a, a workforce that you can basically run in the ground, mm-hmm. and you don't have to pay them anything. Now you have, um, uh, I think of jail too, the Marion County Jail too, right? Where you have complete families who have benefited and enriched themselves on the backs of people who haven't been rehabilitated, who haven't been given opportunities, right. who haven't been uh, uh, um, educated in, in the trades. Not to say that government is responsible for educating people when they're incarcerated. No. But what I'm saying is we spend an exorbitant amount of money uh, on prison systems than we do on our educational systems. And it hasn't gotten us anywhere. Right. We're still at the same place. I would argue worse. Right. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not. We're not. We're not. We haven't accomplished what we thought we were going to accomplish. And I, I know, like, and I, I give you this illustration. Um, 
there are individuals in in the police department when I first got on who literally uh, like, uh, I guess to say this just completely transparent, who literally sat on their butts all day and did absolutely nothing. And that was the goal. The right. goal was to do nothing. And then after the work hour, then you would go to what I call the part time or off duty employment where you see officers parked and do. I wrote a case study on uh, off duty employment and I mm-hmm. used as analysis uh, New Orleans Police Department right after Katrina. Mm-hmm. FBI came in and they did this huge case study of why the New Orleans Police Department were that they were in the predicament that they were in. And, and, and the majority of their analysis and conclusion, the hypothesis that they came up with it, is that. They were dysfunctional because you had patrol officers who were employing captains or higher because the patrol officer ran the off-duty employment. And the off-duty employment per hour, if you were captain, was $55, $65 an hour. So what does that mean? You are now – you're a supervisor on on this individual officer's – day job, but now he's your supervisor on your extra money. So you're going to overlook a lot of things that he or she does during the day because it's going to impact you financially at night. And I think my, my conclusion was like, have it, have a, a body of citizens run the office of off-duty employment because the equipment is not yours. It's the city's. The uniform is not yours. It's the city's. They allow you by oath to put, be put in the position that they can't do themselves or they trust that you can do it effectively. And the goal of that individual who I was talking about when I first got on, that was his goal. Uh, He was making probably double or more from his part-time job than he was during his day job. And that I know. The people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about audits in terms of auditing a personnel. Where is a physical body going? Where is he or she? They don't want to talk about it. Indianapolis hasn't done it. Okay. We haven't even audited the IMPD. Do you see where I'm going with this? Yeah. You see how this can be ripe with um, um, dysfunction. Yes. It can be ripe with dysfunction, and it is. Because not doing an audit doesn't keep people accountable at all. There's no There's no fear of of location. There's no fear of anything. That's exactly right. So the only accountability is internal affairs, or the only accountability are the general orders. Which is another thing I don't agree with. With the police control. Right. And see, so the general orders— uh, this big hoopla that the council wanted the council wanted to to have civilian oversight on the general orders, the policies, and that was a that was a good attempt. Now that, that was good, that was admirable, but that's that won't solve the challenge because then you can craft those are those sub issues that we talk about. What's the culture inside of the agency? Yep. How do you how do people really function? And what I see and what I saw then is. Uh, compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. Now, in some ways, that's good. But in some ways, it's very bad because, as you said, there is no oversight. Right. We need oversight. That's wild. So let's get back to defund. Right, right. Okay. As a police officer, you guys wear many hats. I've had conversations with um, police officers I'm close with, and Mm -hmm. we talk about how they They'll get a raccoon out of some <laughs> tree or, you know, they they get attacked by dogs and, you know, they got to right. open people's car door. Yeah. They, lock, they lock their keys in yeah. when, when there's locksmith that we pay for that. Right. You know, so to make sure police are policing and we're, we're lightening the load for them, that is essentially defunding police. That's exactly right. right? That's exactly right. And I think I, I was laughing and chuckling because I've had to do all of those. Right. That's why, you know, I wasn't yeah. laughing that, I, you know, yeah. but I've had to do all of those. Yeah. But those are all things that I've heard that, yes. that they yes. do. So, yes. I mean, and I'm and I'm I'm guilty of mm-hmm. that call same it. thing. I heard one time that I could call the police. Right. And they would open my car. Yes. Door yeah, and I don't right. have to pay. Right. Exactly. The, and, and it happened. And it happened. And I think that was part of the whole community policing strategy where you really got to know your officer okay. and you really, he or she was vested in, 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 in your community. Yep. Let's look at NYP, for example, NYPD, for example, they have almost 30,000 police, right? But one officer, his or her beat may be a building. <laughs> right. Like, you, you know what yeah. I mean? Now you have officers who are stretched so thin, incredibly thin, right? I, I, I think it's problematic when you ask them to, First of all, I think it's problematic when police departments don't control their run load. Here's what I mean. The Marion County Sheriff's Department runs the radio. 
So they create a policy that says an officer shall respond to a run. <laughs> yeah. And the IMPD is the agency that shows up. So how does that work? It doesn't. So then you have supervisors. I had to do it. And I would disregard officers going to take a, a run that an officer shouldn't have been shouldn't have even been dispatched to. Right. But here in Indianapolis, as part of the um, merger between the IMPD and the Marion County Sheriff's Department, the Marion County Sheriff's Department ended up with the radio. So now you have a agency who has their own policies and procedures and culture. Yep. Another police department who has their own policy, procedures and culture trying to meet a citizen in the middle. How does that work? It doesn't. And these are things that people do not want to discuss. Right. They won't want to discuss it because it's a political maneuver. They don't want to discuss it because people might get offended. You just don't know. Listen, policing should not be political, but we have made it political. Notice right. I said we. When you have the national FOP, Fraternal Order of Police, endorsing Donald Trump on the cover of their magazine, yeah. that's problematic on a lot of levels. Yeah. Because now you can't segregate yourself from the man right. when when it appears from all the evidence that we've heard and read that January 6th, that was an incitement on his part. Correct. So now you as a national FOP have endorsed this man who claimed law and order. Those those worlds don't mix. No, they don't mix. So now you have officers responding to runs that they should not be responding to. Right. And they've actually, if you look at our history in IMPD, we've objected to it. We didn't want to be responsible for uh Felons. This is you hear felons getting out of jail. Now mm -hmm. we're responsible for tracking them and doing this. And that's what the sheriff do? yeah. does. Well, right? Yeah, that's normally. His, that's exactly right. right. But IMPD now has a function okay. of because uh, they want to reduce recidivism. Well, why is that? <laughs> we haven't we haven't any clue what goes on sociologically with someone who's been incarcerated. Yeah, that's not our function. Yep. That's someone else's sub. They are subject matter experts in that area. Why are you because why are you investing? I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm sorry. So why are you investing in that type of resource, those money? Because police are the cheapest and they're the most uh, visible part of government. Yep. It costs a lot more to have social workers or occupational therapists, therapists yeah. or psychologists. Yep. I've, I've heard, I've heard that L.A. is working out a lot of things having. Um, therapists mm -hmm. on, on duty. They mm -hmm. have social workers on duty. 100%. And I I mean, when you defund, you can move those funds towards those, to those people. And you can get police out of civilian jobs that shouldn't be there. Listen to this. And this is, and, and, and I said this in the, on a Facebook post, and I got a lot of pushback from police officers. I'm sure. And I got a lot of pushback in the sense that they were trying to silence me from communicating with the media because I was a public information officer at one point. Yep. And so now you have you have a a a chief, a IMPD. This is this is this is now yep. a IMPD chief making uh, six figures who runs uh, the radio at, uh, at 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 the Marion County Sheriff's Department, which is a position. It's a figurative position. It's, it, it it looks good, but on, on paper it looks good, but also holds a position at the IMPD uh, in, a, in a command position as, as also running our, uh, 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 for lack of better terms, our, our, our joint task force and the, and the officers who review film and review camera, stuff like mm -hmm. that. That's impossible to do those roles uh, simultaneously. Yeah. And it's impossible to do, to be good at one. You're going to, you're going to naturally be poorly out another one. And, but this is the kind of stuff that others are allowed to go on. Right. There should be a civilian who should be getting paid as well, or maybe people would say less, but they should be, there should be some sort of reciprocity or some sort of, uh, of, of a civilian population in the city that should, that should get paid as well. Their civilians haven't been, haven't had a pay increase and their officers who are doing civilian jobs today. That's why um, they don't want to have an audit. Dang. It's, 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 I can who, imagine. Who who allows or who calls for audits? How does that, uh, that, that's a government. That's a government function. We, as citizens, can call for audit. We, if we demand that we want to audit, we want to audit. And that scares a lot of people. Trust me. I'm sure. It scares a lot of people because there are a lot of people here who are getting kickbacks. There are a lot of people now. If we're going to call a spade a spade, we need to call it a spade. Right now, the sheriff's department has employed Every retire, every uh, sheriff that is alive at the sheriff's department, they're consultants. They get consulting pay. 
after after they retire, wow. they also get paid as a consultant. They can show up for work if they want, or they can't if they want. But they're still on a, uh, on the paycheck on the city's dime as a consultant. Wow, that's a problem. I don't even know how that how that yeah, works. And most citizens don't even know that that exists. Yeah. But this is the kind of thing that we have to demand as citizens. And it wasn't. People say I'm disgruntled. No, I was like this when I was on the police department. I was asking questions, and I said this 10 years ago. Right. I said, if we don't change our behavior as a police agency, then somebody's going to do it for us, and we're not going to like it. Well, you know what the problem is? You challenge the status quo. Nobody wants to change. That's exactly right. Nobody wants anything to change because sitting down on my ass and doing nothing Come on. is easy for me. It's comfortable. And it's lucrative. That's exactly right. But but to make me accountable, and mm-hmm. I will keep saying that word I like because that. we are not. We aren't. We are not accountable. But when somebody challenges you, you become the asshole. Yes, yeah, exactly right. Because you're challenging why this person is. You're trying to make sense of this person making so much money doing absolutely nothing. That's exactly right. And then you're labeled either a malcontent or you're labeled a oh, pot yeah. stirrer yeah. or a militant. I remember yeah. one time I had an officer who— Call me militant. Yeah. I'll I, take it. Well, and the thing is, I had an officer who did something. I wrote him up, and and I had to go and, uh, and, and testify in terms of our captain's review board where you kind of put everything on display. And those, that board, those three white men, they were more concerned with the way I was dressed. Oh, well, you know, he's, tell Sergeant Wilburn he's a little too trendy— and I and I looked at the secretary who told me that that they were said, hey, she pulled me to the side and I said, look, I am in compliance with general orders. I have on leather shoes. They didn't like my socks. I, 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 and I said to myself, if these guys are worried about this stuff that do, they're not wearing the clothes and I'm in compliance with general orders, yeah. then we have a big problem. Right. Rather than looking at this person's behavior yeah. and examining that, Talk they're about worried the about yeah, yeah they're yeah. worried about what I have on. Yeah. And 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 I I think that. That is the problem with policing is that everybody wants to be a duplicate of one another. I don't even think that had everything to do with policing. But the situation to me is uh, what what happens in society is they try to discredit the messenger. 100%. First, you know, so maybe that's all they had is, 100%. is how you were dressed. But they love to discredit the messenger. They love to make make light of the negative thing that they can find about you. 100%. So that your message loses value. You know, and and that is a problem. So what is the message that police departments, specifically IMPD or specifically um, the sheriff here in Marion County, what are they communicating? Uh, well, I can tell you what they're communicating. Uh, um, apathy uh, or um, a lack of, of, of care and concern. Yeah. And that's uh, evident by the homicide numbers. Now, you will hear people say, including our executive uh, of the city, uh, who sits in, a, in the mayor's office there, say something different and get everybody worked up. And I understand he's a great orator. But the thing is, is that how do you judge a business if it's successful or not? You look at their gross income, you know, um, you look at how morale is or if people are being retained. You look at is the company growing? Yeah. If we were compared to a company, a Fortune 100 company, because here in Indianapolis, because it's a lot of money that we give to the uh, police department, mm-hmm. then we'll be bankrupt. Oh. Yet we are still uh, constantly asking for more people. Yeah. Constantly asking for uh, better equipment. We haven't proven or haven't we haven't utilized what we've been given till it's to the full to the fullest, and that goes parallel with the fire department. I could talk to brother brother. I talk to brothers all the time. Yeah. Who are like, man, boy, there's only a few people in positions of power. And they put other people just like them who think like them in positions of power. Right. And the city does not benefit with that type of approach. No. We don't. Right. And, that, and, and so it's tough. I know that I'm, I, I, I apologize if I'm on a tangent here. Man, you're preaching. <laughs> you're preaching. But can we talk about, okay, there's, there's two things um, similar that I want to hear your opinion on mm-hmm. um, locally and nationally. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, so what does it take? to run a successful police department locally. Good. We're talking about Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. And then what is it not what does it look like nationally? Like what do you, what do you think matters to where policing is a mirror image in every community? That's good. One, one of the things to answer your question and I and I'll say locally, 
we have to be able to listen to our, our constituents. We have to be able to listen to our citizenry and respond as opposed to coming in the position of this is how you do things, you know? Yeah. And, and then we, I'll talk about that in a sec. And then on a national level, every sovereign, every state uh, has their own heartbeat. They do things the way that works for them. And we have to honor that. However, the guardrails is the Constitution. And the guardrails tell us, you shall do this or you shall do that. I mean, it's it's written right there. People yeah. talk about the framers. The, the Constitution was set up, it, it, it divides three levels of government, you know, and it gives those branches of the government same power. Right. And it also understands this notion that states have a say in how they govern mm-hmm. and what the federal government would do in terms of, uh, of a distribution of power and allocating those power. And then, and, and then if we go back and toggle back to locally, uh, the challenge for a lot of people is to get outside of themselves and come with some humility when you talk to people. And what I mean by that is you can't show up. Now we start to see this, but you can't show up at people's house and say, hey, why don't you just go get a job? You know, go or, or go. And I'm laughing because this is the same individual who worked at Culligan Water as uh, delivering water and now asked me two, three years ago how he can hear he can get on. And now you've arrived. That's what I'm thinking. About. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, you see. Yeah. So we have to exercise a level of humility. How do we do that? We have to sit across the table from one another. Yeah. How do we do that? Conversation. Yeah. What ends up happening with a lot of police departments is that in a lot of officers locally is they're just going from run to run to run. And you alluded to it before when you talked about they're stretched so thin. So they're per citizenry. And I, and I don't know the exact number now because it's all fluffy. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't know an accurate number of how many officers t- to citizen we have, but it's not a lot. Yeah. They're jumping from one place to the other and they can't build those relationships. And the, those who do build those relationships are um, ostracized and criticized. Wow. Yeah, man, you're trying to hug a thug, man. What's up, man? Wow. <laughs> you know, so That's it's crazy. Yeah, it, it is crazy. And then everybody understands that police are supposed to be officer friendly, right? That's what the public, (laughs) you hear that all the time, officer friendly. Yet officers have to use deadly force if if, if that's what's needed. To toggle back from officer friendly to deadly force is a, that's a hard jump. It's a hard jump. How do you mitigate officers uh, 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 from, from, uh, making split decision dissection or, or split second decisions that are, are detrimental to them and the public. You got to give them breaks. Right. Got to give them reprieves. You, you have to talk about it. You have to de you have to deescalate, deconflict, or whatever you. All of those things. You know, debrief whatever you need to do. You need to make sure that that officer has has some level of normalcy. Psychologists will tell you that, um, and that's okay. Yeah. But you don't see that going on. Now, I'm gonna talk back to the federal side of it. I think January sixth was a um it was a it was a a vivid picture of how things can go awry when you have people from all over the country participating in a law in a lawless uh, activity and then the police not condemning the behavior uh, in, in 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 unison and well, why do you think that them not being prepared had a lot to do with it too like well, because because I've seen um split images of when Black Lives Matter was approaching the Capitol and how many police officers were, were there, there was no way they were going to get in. And then that day, do you think that there was a, a lack of um, Prepar- were, yeah, pr- uh, preparation? Well, I think for a lot of police departments, the bad guy um, is portrayed as African-American or darker skin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I'm so here. for a white guy, and I'm not a white guy, I can only imagine psychologically how that must play in your head if that's the only thing you've been fed. Now, that's what I was fed, but I came in that police department much more mature. I've come from a different profession. I was older. Right. And I was like, man, just keep your mouth shut, Chris. That's not how it is. Right. Um, and I think they weren't prepared because they've been told that these are pro-police protesters. Right. And these white guys look like us. Right. And that's why you had an officer, could you please leave? Because it doesn't make sense to him or her mentally. Why are they doing this to me? Right. I'm just, it doesn't make sense. Right. They, get, they got caught. Why in, are they beating me yeah, with a Blue Lives Matter flag? They got caught. That's exactly <laughs> right. They got caught in a OODA loop, man. Right. Observe, orient, decide, and act. They got caught because the other, 
the, they got caught with their pants down. Now, the, and, I, and I haven't been able to look at all the footage, but if you look at most of the footage, with exception when, when uh, the D.C. police came in, they were taking care of business. But most of the Capitol police officers that were f- trying to fend off those protesters were, were, were people of color. Yeah. Uh, why is that? Because. Yeah. Why? is Yeah. That? Because maybe and this is just this is just my theory. Maybe they've always been. Maybe they actually listened to what they were taught in the academy or maybe they just were like, look, I know how it is, man. No, you're not going to get. I have kids. I, I, I don't need to lose this job. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Yeah. But I saw what manifested on January 6th. That is the that is the framework that our federal government used. If you if, if you recall, Obama's administration it, uh, attempted uh, to really, really bring police departments together because he didn't have a lot of support from police departments. No. When he made that statement, uh, uh, when the Harvard professor came into his own home and got arrested by the Cambridge Police Department. What did know, Obama say? Um, he basically was like, he, he said it was that the police that was silly or it was foolish. It was uh, something okay. that, that the national office took Yeah. Personally. Well, I've heard cops say that they didn't like that Obama said that Trayvon Martin looked like his son. Yeah. And see, and why why should that affect you if it yeah. did? Why should and so I've been a proponent uh all along of of and this is gonna be a slow walk down, it's gonna be very difficult and tedious process. How do you remove uh politics from policing? You have to have transparency, accountability. And you have to have dialogue right. uh, from the labor aspect, from the FOP on expectations and from your citizenry giving it is the citizens police department. It's right. not yours. Right. And I think that sometimes people get that. Like my boy said, man, you get it twisted, bro. <laughs> Don't get <laughs> yeah, it twisted. Right. You know, this isn't yours, bro. Right. It, it's not yours. Right. It's it's the citizens. So I think in that regard, that can begin that process. But transparency is very important. I, I will tell I will tell you that just in my own experience, I feel that like where I come from, I come from South Central L.A. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm in Indianapolis now and I was in South Dakota at a time. And I think that um, the way that the community is perceived by police, mm-hmm. by police are different in those areas that I that I came up in. You mean other areas? Other areas. Right. Like growing up in L.A., Mm-hmm. I w- I definitely felt like I was being um, contained. Right. More more. I wasn't being protected. I wasn't being like a, a police officer did not hardly work for me. Mm-hmm. And um, Southside Indianapolis, mm-hmm. I do feel like a cop comes into a situation like, "What's going on? Mm-hmm. How can I help you?" Right. It's a whole different mindset. How how does that? How does that mindset like? How do you fix that? And 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 does, I know that I'm a I'm a huge fan of community policing. Mm-hmm. I'm a huge fan of it because I feel that um, police officers that walk around in the neighborhood develop a relationship with the community. That's good. And um, it's very hard for people to go against people they trust and they know and they know. Yeah. So we don't have that connection in in the ghetto. And, and that's exactly right because. Uh, it's what you said. So I, I remember before I was talking about demonization and how yep. white guys look at, 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 at uh, different um, communities. Yep. You can't police uh, the east side like you do the Carmel. Carmel. Because yep. if you go out and yelling at people, cussing at them at Carmel, you know, like, mother, I just sit down, <laughs> shut up. You know, they go yeah. like, whoa. Right. Well, if you say that on the east side, that is, maybe that's the vernacular people just, d- 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 communicate in. But right. the thing is, is that if you look at basic police training, the first thing that we were taught when I was in part of the uh, mobile field force or emergency response group is like, yeah, the illustration would be, yeah, when you go down to the Black Expo and I'm like, whoa, 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 <laughs> all the violence don't go down just at the Black Expo, bro. Come on, man. You know, so <laughs> when you go down to the Black Expo, man, you know, you got to be you gotta yeah, tight ready. Ready. Yeah, you gotta be ready. Be ready. And I was like, man, <laughs> you know, so I think. That there's a there's this notion that you have to police the same way in every part of it, it, it's what we talked about compartmentalization. There are there are hundreds of communities who have that different vibe. They just feel that they they some they're very very concerned about the communities. Others don't care. Yeah. But I think like if you have a police agency and you've actually taken the steps to get a good blend of officers and citizens 
who are hired by the city, whose job, primary job, is not to do um, lockouts. They control their own runs. Uh, they are given the resources, true resources, to do their thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they'll find some measure of success. Right. The problem is that you have a chief of police who runs the city police the agency from downtown. That, yeah. <laughs> it, it just doesn't make any sense. Right. You have field commanders in the military. Yeah, the Department of Defense runs the military, but you have field commanders who are given autonomy and given uh, uh, discretion to lead. And I think what ends up happening is there's just, there's so much stagnant uh, um, uh, thinking yeah. within the context of policing and, mm-hmm. and public safety, we re- we really need to redefine what policing is for us. And I think that that's that's where we are. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Most people think it's a bad. Th- there, I will tell you, there'll be times where you have to have a tactical team respond. But everybody on a whole police department can't be tactical. You know, no. <laughs> everybody yeah. can't show up. Right. You know what I mean? That's just not right. how things work. Right? When, where's somebody who's going to be able to talk to me? Where's somebody who's going to be able to understand, ma'am, stop moving your hands around. Well, hell, that's how I talk, bro. Right. You know, and I get up like, hey, man, calm down. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I was the only brother on the entire district, the only black supervisor. Wow. And I, and, and you say like, well, you know, you took the test, you did it. Man, that test was garbage. Yeah. And it does not measure whether or not you have the leadership capabilities or the education or aptitude yep. to lead. Yep. And I think that that's where we are right now. We really, really need to rethink policing, rethink who we put in positions of power and how much money we allocate. I can tell you there have been previous administrations who run the police department who ran that mug into the ground. Wow. Who ran it into the ground. Crazy. <laughs> you have a quote. You have a quote from your um, your op-ed in the in yeah. Star that I liked. I I'm going to read it real quick. Okay. If police agencies despise the men and women they are charged to protect, the rule of law is jeopardized and police function ceases. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Yeah, I, I think here's the thing, and I talked about this in one of my uh, in our one of my law classes, and we talked about Wallace, and we talked about him disregarding the Constitution. Uh, William Barr, when he was uh, uh, attorney general, talked yeah. about disregarding some of the Constitu- yeah, yeah. <laughs> constitutional protections. And I think when you have police agencies in America, American police departments, who exist to protect the community and who exist to really, really be an advocate, they're advocates. That's advocacy. Uh, who look at the citizens and say, like, like, you know, speak to them like, uh, like they're trash. Um, no compassion, uh, no empathy, no, and, and, and no care and concern. Now, that's not the whole— That's not everybody. That's yeah. not everybody, and I don't want to paint and that And I picture. think that is very important that like, you're talking about that because I think that when you approach a situation and, and your mind is made up, that's a disservice to the people you're serving. You know— it, it completely is. It's a I, I've been on both sides yeah, of it, too. Me, too. I, I, I've been approached with compassion, mm-hmm. and I've been approached with, uh, like, I mean, like like I'm the criminal. Because it's scared. It's fear. Yeah. So when you're scared, you you typically ex- you get caught in a, uh, in a response uh, type of uh, posture. Right. And, you know, I'm the bigger, badder thing. I, got, I, can, I can get on this radio, and I can call somebody to come over here. You know, that yeah. kind of thinking. Uh, and it's not self-preservation. It's just like that kind of a bravado is what right. I call it, machismo. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so what ends up happening is that officer may put you in a position where you're like, man, only thing I got left, not knowing the background of how you got there, only thing I got left is my manhood. And I ain't finna let this dude talk to me like this. Right. You see what I mean? Right. We don't know the picture that was painted prior to that officer interacting with that citizen Correct. at that moment. Correct. And I think what ends up happening is we build such a, we codify our, uh, our expectations when it comes to police. We expect black folk to act like this and do like this. And when we go to those runs and then we respond in a certain way because it's worked in the past. Correct. And so familiarity, you t- we talked about it earlier. I think a lot of these officers need to get a break. They need to be removed. They need to get those special positions. They need to do those, those cool jobs that, that only a select few, yeah. or if not divide the police department, give districts, 
uh, the ability, get, make those chiefs of those districts and give them ability, uh, accountability. If they don't meet the standard, then you need to put somebody else in there who can. Yeah. That sort of, uh, of examination needs to occur. It hasn't occurred. Yep. Nobody wants to talk about it, Republican or Democrat, uh, independent. But now we have a problem. This is a powder keg. We have a problem when 200 plus homicides uh, last year that's a problem for Indianapolis mm-hmm. because it takes away from our economic infrastructure. It affects you and me. Those are the second and third order effects. It affects us. Yeah. And I think that, that that's where we are. Yeah. You know, so that, so when I say that, they, that sort of dis, despising type of uh, attitude, it's in our swag, it's in our communication, it's in the nonverbals. Like, yeah, whatever, man. Right. Yo, good to get, you know, I can care less about what you're telling me. Yeah. I'm just here cause I have to be. Dang. That does. Mm. Okay. I want to give you I want to give you my idea of how um I can change policing. Oh, this and is I, good. And this I want to hear what oh, you think. Oh, this is good. I want this to hear what good. you think. Okay. And I've I, I mean I've been thinking about this for right, a long sure. time. I have a lot of different um if I could make a plan, right, right. this is what it looks like. Um first of all, I think that policing should be a job that a police officer doesn't want to lose. And by saying that, I mean, um, you have to, one, make it a very lucrative job. 100% agree with you. I agree. Pay them a lot of money. I agree. But also, high rewards with high um, punishment or or keeping them accountable, okay? So I want, I want police officers paid in the six figures, mm-hmm. okay? Um, they do do a very— um, Honorable job. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a job that is hard, mm-hmm. and I think that it also requires plenty of more this training. Plenty of more training. Mm-hmm. So I don't. How long is a normal academy? So a normal academy is about six months. So why don't they make it a four year degree? They do that. In, they do that in some. Uh, in some. Uh, uh, okay. Well, let's do it for all of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's make it a four year degree. Yeah, okay. Is, okay. So you said pay, education. I'm and talking training. six. Yeah, I'm, I'm 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 gonna say all the good stuff yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're gonna pay them six figures. We're gonna um, give them a free education. So so you're getting a scholarship to do this. So you're going for a um, a four year degree. You're getting a bachelor in a bachelor's in policing. That's good. Okay. Um, just like the military, you get a you military get military college. You, you get college yeah. for your children. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, also, you get the same pension. Okay, so those are all the things that you're you're giving. Mm-hmm. What you risk is that you lose your job if you're okay. One, if you're in, in if you're in a um, a shootout or there's there's any kind of um, criminal investigation into you mm-hmm. and you're found guilty, you mm-hmm. lose everything. Mm-hmm. And, and not only do your do, does your family lose it, but you then owe. For your your education, it's good. Okay, and you also are under investigation every single time there is a situation that happens in it, and, and you're involved. So you know that every time that there is something that happens, it will be investigated. It's mm-hmm. not no, we need to see if we have enough evidence and all that. No, we're gonna investigate everything to make sure that everything was on the up and up. So mm-hmm. now you're going to you're going to risk all this stuff before it happens and and I know what police officers are going to say. <laughs> I know what they're going to say. Right. They're going to say you're going to make us not want to do anything. You're not going to you you're you're going to make us not want to police mm-hmm. cuz we're going to be scared to shoot because who's going to say who's to say that mm-hmm. I was right in this situation. Mm-hmm. And that and to me that's a cop out. Right. You know what I mean, but yeah. that's my plan. <laughs> uh, also, 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 I think that I think that police officers should be um, elected. Oh, that's good. Yeah, you I know, think that I think that they have to sit in front before you're hired. You have to sit in front of a community, um, a, a citizens uh, panel, and they interview you. They're a part of the interview process. That's good, and I, I think I think first and foremost, I think that this is cool that you're actually taking the time and really discussed 
uh, with not just your your internal dialogue, but also too with somebody else. I could tell you got you, you probably have a buddy. I'll just kind of chop it up. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you on a lot of points, and then I want to add a couple more that you didn't discuss. But I think let's look at let's look at all the pluses first, right? So you talk about pay. Uh, I think that that's that's important, and that's, I think. Uh, when you look at some of the things we've discussed here to this afternoon about all of the off-duty employment things, if you pay an officer more and you expect more out of them, they don't want to mess that up. Right. You know what I mean? They don't want to mess that up. And and that's a good point. I think if you look at New Jersey, for example, New Jersey uh, Highway Patrol, State Patrol, uh, they're some of the highest paid uh, law enforcement professionals in the nation. Wow. And these guys are making up with like 160 some Dang. of them, but it, the cost of living is high, but they get to live in other parts of the country and they have a great pension for them. Yeah. Now it's bankrupt some of the uh, <laughs> the state of New Jersey. But I think if you look at what they're paying those guys, that there's very little um, turnover. Yeah. They're very limited in their problems, what they have with their uh, uh, personnel. Yep. And there's a work-life balance uh, that is rarely discussed in policing. So okay. pay is good. Yep. And I think like what you talked about too, in, in terms of the education and training, I like that because you're constantly evolving. And I call those like when I uh, eventually when I take the bar, we'll have a CLEs, continuing legal education. Okay. Oftentimes, police departments sit back and they call them in-service training where they Mm -hmm. sit back and they're just like, man, whatever, man, we got to do this. Um, Non-biased training. And and they they, they speak very negatively about the experience. Right. But that's for them. But they don't think that it's for them. It's just an opportunity to complain. Cops can be very cynical. Because that's all they see is negative. And, and, and remember what we said, like your mind always, your mind adapts very quickly. Yep. And it's hard to get out of that rut mentally, but very easy to get into it. Yep. And I think like uh, when, you, when you talked about the four-year degree component, I think of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Their training is years. Yeah. So you're talking years of training before they can be a Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Right. And that's important. Yeah. I, I think training and, and discussing these things, not by policemen, but people who have subject matter degrees or expertise. And I'm not talking, I went to this training and this, no, bro. I'm talking about, do you have a degree in accounting? Yeah. Do you have a degree in finance? Yeah. Do you have a degree in computer technology and computer? Where, let me see your A plus certification. Right. Well, you know, I can fiddle around with Microsoft. <laughs> nah, bro. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that's yeah. the kind of mentality. Yeah. So I yeah. think that those are good points. And then the pension piece, I said it like this, and this is going to blow your mind. <laughs> there should be a mandatory retirement age oh, in I IMPD. Like that too. Here's the deal. You got guys, and I had it, and, and I'm not going to mention this brother's name, this lieutenant's name, because he's older. and He's probably he's still alive, probably. <laughs> that mug was on the department for 50-something years, 70-something years old. Wow. Now, I'm thinking to myself, like, okay, that's cool and all, but, man, if the federal government can tell their FBI agents that there's a mandatory retirement age, why can't local police departments. Yeah. Now, we don't have to do what the feds do. No. Yeah. But what I'm saying in, in Indianapolis, you need to have a shedding of generations and add more generations. The average age of this police department right now is over 50. No, it ain't. It's somewhere close. I'm exaggerating, but it's somewhere <laughs> close. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's 110. It's 110, bro. <laughs> no, but I'm exaggerating, but it is right. very high. Dang. It's somewhere, and that's a problem. That's that because is, that people don't want to leave. Why don't they want to leave? They don't do what they're... They don't do what they're uh, requested to do in terms of what the requirement is, or yeah. they'll meet the minimum standard. Right. I heard this all the time. Well, how was so-and-so officer? Well, you know, he come to work on time and he looked good in his uniform. Didn't and then I sat there, wait, w- w- what else? That yeah. was it. Wow. He go, You know, he goes to the runs and he looks good in uniform. If that's the criteria, if that's the barometer that you judge for success, bro, I need you to take several seats. Yeah. There's plenty of them, man. Right. That's your leadership. Well, Go ahead and sit down. Several seats. Take several seats. <laughs> exactly. That was his career. That was his career. <laughs> yeah. Taking seats. Wow. Yeah. So I think that what you're saying is really good. But I also want to add to that about uh, uh, retirement. And if they're in leadership positions, obviously not. But there needs to be a constant shedding where you don't make people uncomfortable. These dudes are comfortable. They eating jelly on their toast and they're comfortable. Yeah. And everybody else is drinking swamp water. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's a big misconception that police only make 30 something thousand dollars a year by the community. Oh, he don't even make a lot of money. There has never been an audit. These guys don't know what these guys are making. Right. They don't follow the news. Right. And then you brought a couple of points up. I'm going to tell you the two. You talk about the risk. Oh, you said something to the, about the risk nature. The, the, when I think risk, the first thing I think of is that you could be shot. 
Yeah. You know, because they're knuckleheads anywhere and everywhere. Yep. You had to go hands on with people. Yep. You had to, you know, throw the yep. knuckles. Yep. They're knuckleheads everywhere. It's just the way the life, the, the world works. Right. Um, if the officer, like, if the officer has to risk his or her life, there should be a reward. They should be getting paid six figures. Yeah. But there's an expectation, like you said, that is like, look, okay, we're going to pay you a lot. We know that you're putting your life on the line. We know we're going to treat you well uh, in, in, in retirement. We go, Okay, that's fine. Most officers, when they retire, they don't even get their pension payments for more than four years. They die of heart failure. Wow. It's because of the stress that is never addressed. So you said something, too, about— uh, 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 about uh, um, the job about how, and I like that aspect in terms of like, you could lose your job if you don't do what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And that is the fundamental problem. And it is where we are right now. Majority of people uh, are protected, not just by the FOP, but by the culture yeah. of policing. Here's a, here's a case study. This has actually happened. There was an officer who I will, won't name who got a DUI and he had, he was in a specialized unit, meaning he was in one of the units, tactical air or SWAT or mm -hmm. K-9, one of those tactics. And he was very close to retirement. And there was a lot of feet dragging to get him really close. And he got there. You see where I'm going with this? Yep. He got there close. So the, the deal between the prosecutor, okay, now you retire, you resign, but now he gets a pension when he could have lost his job because right. it was the second DUI. Dang. So- why does that happen? And I understand the thin blue line. People yep. say that. But for me, I never saw the thin blue line. I saw a vapor blue line. Yeah. Because whenever I stepped out of place, and, I, and I'm not going to say this, but I like. Yeah. And yeah. I get yeah. you in place. Yeah. You know, and I never told it the line like that. I didn't disrespect. I would, there are times people try to yell at me and I look at them fool like, hey, man, are you seriously doing? Hey. Right. Looking at them sideways. Like, right. look, I know you're not yelling, trying to yell at me. Right. You know, but I, I think like if people have that type of when it's on the line like that in terms of their job or their their being comfortable, that's a good thing. Um, if they commit a crime, I agree with you. I also say this constant background checks. Ooh. You're constantly I want to add to that component. Right. So when you do that, OK, there are some kids. I have three kids. Yep. And there's well, I can't parent them the same couple of my kiddos, I got to stay on them, boy. <laughs> got to, hey, did you do that? Did you, hey, did, I, did you really take the uh, fruit snacks? <laughs> no, I ain't take it. They swear up and down. I said, well, why is there a fruit snack package in your room? Right. So I'm always looking. Yep. Some people will follow. My oldest, she follows the rules because she just follows the rules. Yep. There are some people in the police department who follow the rules because that's what you said to do. Yep. There's some that going to walk that line. And there's some that's going to jump back over, back and forth. And that is why you have constant refresher background checks where you're constantly putting people on on blast. Yep. If, if, if there's some things that we need as a condition of your employment, if you want to stay here, you're going to submit to this background check like you do your drug tests. Yeah. So let's do that. I agree with that. You know, yeah. and there's, and listen, when they say random drug test, ain't no random drug test, bro. Because when I, before I uh, retired, I had three or four consecutive uh, uh, drug tests. Wow. And that's because they were trying to find a reason to get rid of me. But that's a different story. But that's what they do. Right. They, they, they stack up the paper. That's right. what you'll hear them say. We, yeah. I mean, we're going to stack up this paperwork on them. That's what this is. So um, I'm going to hit one more, two more that you said, yeah, too. Yeah. You said, uh, um, um, like you said, under investigation, what ends up happening when they when they do do their crime, internal affairs reviews it. Yep. They have a unit called, uh, uh, they do political, like special, uh, special investigation unit yep. that investigate uh, people. But I think if we look at it from this point, and then I'll be done, I'll land a plane. When people are sworn in as police officers, that's actually a line item. You talked about being elected. That's a line item. So that's a line. They're in the office of police officer. Right. So we need to we need to magnify that. Then have citizens sit on interview panels. I yep. think that that's good. Yep. Who's going to be uh, on my police force? Not just because what ends up happening now, just the police interview for police positions. Correct. And that's right. like, all right, right, well, how am I going to have some say on who gets to be on my side of the town right. or right. or be in my uniform or right. be my policeman? Right. You know, so Especially I think when people who are policing and doing the interviews, they, yes. don't, they don't have a, a ear to the ground in the community. No, they don't. And, and, and more often than so not. So how do they know exactly. what's good for that community? That's exactly right. Yeah. They don't. Right. And most oftentimes you end up putting like uh, the, the police department now and IMP is so segregated. If you look at the south side. Only white officers want to work there, the southeast side, because they all live on that side of town. Right. And they want to have that slow roll to get home when, when it's time to go home. And I get it. Uh, but 
when you put a black officer there, listen, and, and this is going to surprise people. When you put a black officer on a predominantly white district and then you have supervisors condoning racist behavior in the police department in 2020, in 2019, and 20, it's a problem. Yeah, there is a problem. Right. And I think I think that most times uh, these things aren't discussed because we want police to be able to handle their own internal conflicts and, and be able to, to mitigate those things very quickly. But we also need to have transparency and oversight. So I, I think that the, you, you've raised some good points. Yeah. I think you've raised, uh, you've, you've roused my intellect. Uh, good, you good, know what yeah. I'm saying? <laughs> For real. That's, that's dope. Um, I mean, I could talk to you man, for, I, I, for hours. I, man, listen, I know we have to <laughs> wrap it up. Listen, I, hey, you got to get me back up in <laughs> here, man. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, you know what I really want to, this is what I want to do. I want to have you and a, and a, and a, and a police officer not of color right. together. I'd be good. That'd yeah. be good. I would love to do that. So. Yeah. I, I, you know, I try to uh, uh, make a couple calls. You know. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Man. I mean, especially somebody that you think actually has a different viewpoint than you. Absolutely. As well. And I think that that's critical. That's so important, yeah. right? Because if you can see the landmines that I can't see, yeah. then we both miss them and right. we don't die. <laughs> Absolutely. And like, I, think, I, I, I yeah. don't, I don't dodge. I don't, I don't uh, hide away from the other side. You know what I mean? Like, I want to hear that opinion. 100%. And that's how you grow. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times, a lot of police agencies don't want to grow. They say they want to grow. They say they want to change on a scale of 1 to 10. Yeah, I'm 10 with change. All right, we're going to switch it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Not me. I thought you were talking about him. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I think that if we hold people's feet to the fire and we expect more, people will either meet the standard or they won't. Right. And that's what we need to do. We need to have a greater expectation of our police department. Remove barriers. Yep. Remove barriers that stand in the way of success and then examine what works and what doesn't. I and agree. if stuff doesn't work, get rid of it. Yep. And the stuff that does work, enhance. Yep. Well, at the end of every show, I ask a question that you are not prepared for. <laughs> and yours, my friend. Here we go. If you could have any superpower. Right. Anyone. It's mm -hmm. just one power, though. What would it be and why would you choose it? Ooh, that's good. For me, that's the thing that immediately came, immediately came to mind as uh, contentment. Even though that doesn't seem like a superpower, it's contentment. Because I think the reason I say contentment, that is, is something that I've really, really strived to, to uh, gain a higher understanding. Uh, being satisfied Ooh. with what you have. Uh, not examining someone else's, but being content and satisfied with what you have. Because then... And only then can I attain true peace and true happiness. Wow. All of those things are kind of, they kind of work towards uh, the same. And, you know, some people may wish for money, but we all know the more money, the more problems. Yeah. The more you make, the more you spend. We all know all those things. But for me, it would be contentment. And then to couple that, the reason I chose that, like I said, is because those worlds exist together. And then if I have contentment, if I have that true contentment, then I'll be able to live life to the fullest. And I will be rewarded in the mundane things in life, man. Right. You know what I mean? Like right. being able to smell a flower right. or the touch of a, 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 a of my wife's lips when I kiss her or yeah. uh, the taste of some good ice cream. Yeah. And just really sit there in that moment. And it's staying, like you seek enlightenment. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Staying in the present. And wow. I think so, so many times we really try to attain things and we try to reach for things rather than really, really appreciating and loving and, and, and really being content and happy in where we are right now. Wow. So that's it for that's all. I ain't trying to be deep, but that's hey, just how. I, but you got deep. <laughs> I mean, man, that just spoke a lot to your character, though. My appreciate that you. you choose that. You know, yeah. that's man, that's amazing. But because a lot of people need to realize that being content is just yeah. I, I mean, it, it's not easy. It's a decision. It's not easy. No, yeah, it isn't we, easy. And, yeah. and, 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 and it's I, definitely a choice. That's exactly it. Yeah. And I think like so so many times, you know, when like before, you know, we want to cop that nice car, we want to get that, you know, mm -hmm. we want to get that nice truck. We want, mm -hmm. but do we really need it? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Are we happy where we are, you know? Yep. Uh, you know, I, I really appreciate you. I'm going to say this to your audience, man. When I came in, brother hooked me up with some swag. <laughs> and talking about contentment. I, I told him, hey, what did I tell you though? Before I came in, I said, man, I, I, I would have ordered, uh, asked for a smedia. Uh, you know, small enemy is soft them chest, but shh, I'm married. I was like, <laughs> You say you don't need a I don't need no medium no more. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm content yeah. with the woman I have. You see yeah. what I'm saying? So yeah, it's a go. growth. It's it's growth, man. And right. I, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I for mean, you're you're the man. I'm a wetter swag with hey, pride bro. and distinction, Please. bro. Please. So, 
how can people find you uh, social media wise? Yeah, um, yeah you, you made a good point. Um, you can find me on Facebook. Um, I got a Twitter, uh, a Twitter handle, um, uh, politics in terms of like uh, truth, uh, truth rebel. OK, OK. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, the funny thing is, is that um, I wasn't really active on social media. So when you came and when we talked initially, yeah. Um, I was like, all right, cool. And the reason I wasn't active is because the parameters that the police put on you, man, oh. it's almost you lose your ability for your first amendment right, to, to speak your mind. Okay. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to them. Right. So it's hard to kind of balance that individuality right. and, and creativity. So I'm, I'm getting back in the mix, man. Oh, and, good. You know, yeah. so, okay. so yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now, man, you got to have you back. I appreciate it. I will, being I promise. Here. I, have yeah, a lot yeah. more, I have a lot more I want to get into. Yeah. That sounds but I want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, thank Chris for coming. Thank everybody in the studio for everything <laughs> that they do. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks you for following D Money. <laughs>